Let us kick this off because I am very anxious to introduce Chuck here. Um, since joining Facebook about once or twice a week, I get people uh, telling me about the influence that the 128 or Commodore in general. Actually, I get a lot more uh, about add on to that about Commodore and what it did to their lives and what that was like in their childhood and how many people are working in the IT and, and technology fields today. Um, do those, and I know exactly what they mean because I have my version of that. And that version is the 6502 and the work that Chuck Peddle did and, and everything came before it. I was, I was a T repairman in Indiana. That was it for technology. I come out east and I work for a company that had the 6502 and that was it. It, it, it opened the door for me. And so it, it's a chain of things leading back to, uh, so Chuck is one of my, my heroes here. And the more I hear from him uh, as far as what he did because we take so much for granted, uh, you know, inventing PIAs and, and taking processors the size of multiple dinner plates. You know, we could be accused of just hooking those parts together sometimes, you know, the, as, as people came along later. They were the ones making this stuff happen. So with that, I, I, and, and Chuck and his people don't get the uh, accolades that I think they're due and I think there's some revisionism going on out there and and as we talk today I think you'll catch on who I'm talking about but the uh, the uh, you know they don't get the credit that I think they do for being the true father of the PC the home computer and his team and, and one of the things we talked about was making sure we get some of those names out there and when I worked at Commodore I didn't all know all the names either, and I, I, I was a young man at the time, and I wished I had stopped and said, well, who used to sit in that chair right there, and whose cigar butt is that there, you know? Um, but so I'd like to take that opportunity today and catch up some of the stories. So, Chuck, I know some of the questions we'd love to know is, like, tell us about the 6502, where's the 6501 at, uh, you know, the modes, and, and tell us about the PIA and why that was important to you. and. And I, I know I'd love to, to, you know, hear about you told stories about Petsky, and of course there's some great stories about Radio Shack and Microsoft in the old days and whatnot. So, with that, you know, tell us, jump in anywhere you want, but tell us about the O2 or 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 where that came from. What what was it that drove your vision on that? Um, I was born in a hick town called Maine, hick, hick state, hit area, I don't know, whatever, right? And uh, grew up. My dad was a poacher, and so we, and the only way we could eat was eat deer meat. And uh, so I was, when I thought I was going to wind up a radio announcer until I discovered I went to, a, to compete for a um, contest to see if I could get a scholarship because we were so poor. And I realized that there were really talented people in the world, and I wasn't one of them. So I went back very broken and he, at that point the guy who owned the local radio station is also a neighbor and a couple of my uh, instructors at school said we were hoping you'd get rid of that vision because it was a bad one for you and we think you should go to school to be an engineer and you, what you can do is go to school and be an engineer in the TV business because the TV business is just coming on stream Okay, so I went trundling off to this university, which is the Cal College University, but was the only one I could afford, and um, got on campus and, and decided to take a course called Engineering Physics because I didn't have an idea what I wanted to be. I really didn't see myself as designing TV sets, and I didn't see myself designing TV transmission equipment either, but I didn't know what I wanted to be. Uh, and the reason for the Engineering Physics being so important is that it was a broad course. You get to take a lot of different things. And because we kind of set our own curriculum, in my junior year, I took a class from a guy who was teaching this class called Information Theory. Now, for you guys that are all listening, all of you grew up with Information Theory. You grew up with a telephone system that used it, okay? But it didn't used to be there. And the guy who put it there was a guy by the name of Claude Shannon from Lincoln Labs and, and MIT. And he was the pioneer. He's the guy that defined the bit. He defined a whole lot of things. And, and he was the guy that defined and implemented the telephone system. Well, this information, but the word information theory just, you know, okay, let's go see. It's to our class. I can afford it. Da, 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 right? So it turned out the guy that was teaching the class had worked with Shannon very closely until he had a nervous breakdown. 
and he went to the University of Maine to recover and they gave him two classes a week to teach at just before noon because they he was such a brilliant guy and they really wanted him so we walk into this class and the guy says there's only two ways you can communicate with anybody is through their eye and through their ear so we're going to spend the first half of this course studying the eye and ear which I thought was great actually I learned a whole bunch of stuff that I've used in intermittently since then but then he all of us then he starts walking through the redundancy of the English language and beginning the redundancy of the French language and so forth and he gave us that and kind of got us excited about it and then he went into binary arithmetic Boolean logic and a little bit about computers because it went you know it was hard to talk about computers at that time well he changed my life I fell so much in love with the concept of logic and, and binary and computers that I said that's what I'm going to be right so there was nobody on campus to advise me of that because I graduated in 1959 and in 1959 there was not one computer on this campus which had like 7,000 students right uh, the professors were still stuck in the vacuum tube age and we I, I got big credit for my senior presentation that you had to make as a physics student because I showed everybody and around Carrie right? I mean there was nothing there except this guy and but luckily guys like GE and Philco and IBM were hiring and I decided because that Marine Corps had taken me to California that I only wanted to wind up in California so I went to work for General Electric Company who at that time had just done the magnetic ink recognition equipment for Bank of America the guy who did that his name was John Paven and we're gonna meet John Paven in again in a crucial part of my history All right. um, and GE pioneered a whole bunch of things during the time I was there we pioneered the way you did did design using computers we actually designed most of our computers using computers they did the first online systems while we were doing that the we had a computer called a 225 and and this friend of mine that later on started a, his own video company video, video terminal company uh, was the guy that was telling everybody you have to hook up computers right you have to hook computers up this way and I want to take a deviation here because the other thing that we learned at GE was we started working on disk drives when I went back to Phoenix I was in a computer lab and, and what was important about that is I met some people that were important later but um, we in GE they had bought this company that was making a hard disk because the guys couldn't make the hard disk and we were challenged to try to make a hard disk work so we had a four platter five megabyte hard drive and the four it was bigger than taller than me and uh, the positioning arm was you had a, a motor long motor uh, uh, flat motor I forget the right word and you grounded the right location and the, the, the heads would move to that location and then you'd sink on it and what was important was I fell in love with disk drives and actually we filed a patent on zone recording and for those of you who don't know what zone recording is every time you get out on a track when you can add a sector you do and it gives you a lot more density and all of the drives today use it we used to actually use that concept at Commodore to make disks that were bigger than other people's and, and uh, uh, the patent actually ran out for a long time ago but I want to highlight one thing about that it was a great idea we pulled it off but we couldn't build it the electronics that we had to build that kind of logic with wasn't really there we could have made a full computer to do it with with core memory and everything but we didn't and you're going to hear this story a couple more times about we couldn't build it